connectedness. Um, the connectedness, very simple, is what we explained with Google. You search, search something, the jellyfish, and here you have links. So this is a representation of the search results. And here you have links, and if I click, then you go to a second page. And the idea here is that uh, resource representations are hypermedia. So HTTP is called the hypertext transfer protocol. When they invented it, there was only text there. Now we have videos and pictures and movies and whatever. So it, now it's called media. And what does hypermedia mean? It means that you have uh, resources that are data. This is what people are interested in. So they want to see the, 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 the news article or they want to see the video. And then you have references to other resources. So you link to other resources, how? With hyperlinks. In the web browser, you click them. If you develop your own software that wants to navigate hyperlinks, you need to pass the response you get from the server, extract it, and then invoke this URI, for example. So Fielding, in his PhD thesis, had this interesting uh, sentence that many used to cite when they talk about restful services. He says hypermedia is the engine of the application state. What, what does it mean? In essence, it means hypermedia is it, it's a network of connected resources. And while you navigate through it, you progress and your path through this graph of navigations is your application state. If you don't navigate, you're always in the same. If you navigate to page two and three and five, then you followed one path and this is your local personal state. Somebody else will follow a completely different path and it's a different state. And the idea is that using this graph where hyperlinks are the URIs and the URIs encode the, uh, the client state, then hypermedia becomes your application state. You don't need to think very much about it. It is this network of interlinked resources that already allows you to keep track of your own state. You just need to navigate correctly. And uh, how do you navigate correctly? It is very simple. The server knows what you can do and what you cannot do. This is clear. But it doesn't want to take tr uh, keep track of what, you, of what you do and what you don't do. So it writes into the representation that it sends back to you. It, it, it sends you the possible actions you can do. These actions in the web are just links. So uh, as I said, if you click in Amazon on the, uh, on, the, on the shopping cart button, you go to the shopping cart page. OK, this is one navigation. And I get the representation of the shopping cart. There, I, only, I don't get only the representation of the shopping cart. I also get now links to operations, to new things that I can do. So I can, for example, check out the books I have in the shopping cart. I don't have the checkout button if I, don't, uh, I, if I am not in the, in the page of the shopping cart. That's the idea. So if you are just looking at plain Amazon, you have books. And you can buy books, and you can add books to your shopping cart. These are links. And it is the server who tells you what you can do in that state. But you manage it locally. Then you locally decide whether you click here or there. If you go to the shopping cart, you have your list of books. And you can say, now check out. But the important thing is, you see the graph. There is a graph with links. And the links tell you what you can do. Each link corresponds to an action. And your navigation along these links is what you do in the application. It's, it's, it's your application state. And the server, in each step of your action, you do something, you get the representation back. And the, representat <coughs> the representation that you get back contains what you can do next. Of course, in the web, you can always go back. It's obvious. But uh, it's only the server that tells you in the representation where you, what you can do next. You don't know beforehand. That's important. There's another property of uh, the addressability, which is that it's somehow contradicting what I just said. You might know beforehand what you can do, because RESTful services, if they are stateless, 
then they allow you to bookmark the addresses. So you go into Google page number 10 and you just bookmark the link that tells Google to give you results of page number 10. You just bookmark it. And if you invoke the same link in one year again, you will go and get exactly the same results. So in a sense, you, you can also know where your navigation goes. But at least once, you need to navigate through the graph and you need to get there. This is here uh, three examples about links and connectedness. ABC here should be seen as three services, software services, applications, whatever. A here is like the basic RPC. So there's only one resource. There's no interconnection among resources. And this resource here manages all the interactions. In case number B, we have different resources. We have books, we have orders, we have users. Fine, but there's no interconnection among them. So in Amazon terms, you would have books here, and you would have a shopping cart here, and you would have users here. But you would have to know all these addresses before. And when you want to place a book into the shopping cart, here probably you would copy uh, the identifier of the book, the ISBN. Then you go to the completely different URI, and you say, add this ID. This doesn't make sense, of course. That's why we need to have this kind of interconnection of, uh, of resources. So here we have the, the book with the shopping cart and the user. And you can just say here, this is the list of books. And each, list, each book will have the link add to shopping cart. And if you click it, you automatically get here. So you see, this is the graph I was talking about. So this means doing a real RESTful service. <coughs> Does this make sense? So it, it's maybe, let's say, the, the most effective way of thinking about all this is really think about just web applications. You navigate, you click, and you do this. And then you need to understand when you want to do a RESTful web service, there is no browser any longer. There is no human any longer. There is just a piece of software. So this piece of software needs to replace the functionality of the browser, which is issuing a HTTP request passing uh, representations that come back, identifying the actions that can be taken, which are the, the links, and then enacting the links again. This is the, the key difference. Uniform interface, this is the last, uh, the last part of the, of the class today, I would say. It's already quite dense. Maybe if, if, if there's time, I can also show some, uh, just a very simple example. Um, let's go back to HTTP. So I told you about navigating and about all these things. Uh, in the end, when we talk about programming, we know it's not just like the web, which is reading. But we need to do much more. We need to create new resources. We need to store objects. We need to manipulate objects. So we developing software is programming, is manipulating things, is processing. And for this purpose, <clears throat> the idea of RESTful web services is very different from what you might be used uh, from... Let's go immediately to the second slide here, and then we go back. In, in traditional programming, you are doing this, right? You would have your class, and you say, uh, Amazon, get customer. And then you get the customer associated to, or let's say, book order, get customer. So you know there's an object book order. You invoke the get customer function, and you get the customer back. You can do update customer, and you update the data associated to that customer. You can delete the customer ID, for example. This is what you do in traditional programming. REST is very different. It says very simply, um, HTTP is there, it's a standard protocol, and it already comes with a, a set of operations that actually do this. So the, the basic operations of REST are get to read, then we have uh, put to create, we have post and put that we can use to update, 
and we have delete to delete things. So the, these are the CRUD, C-R-U-D, operations of databases. And uh, the idea of REST is now this, that you don't invent your own uh, operation names, which are, you know, if, if I ask you to develop a, a shopping cart management application, each of you will invent different names for operations and different classes. Uh, this is exactly what we want to prevent with the, the REST full style. We say we only use these four. There are more types of operations, but let's just focus on these four. We only use four types of operations in all the services. So if you want to interact with the service, you know, there are these four operations, put, get, post, and so on. So what do you do? You do get in order to get information back. You do put in order to update. And you do delete in order to delete. It's, if you think just about one example, then you say, but it's the same thing. But think about, you have to program an application and you have to use 20 different web services, 20 different remote services. If each of these 20 different services uses a completely own interpretation of the, the, of the operations, everybody invents a get customer and you have, you have the same names, get customer here, get customer there, but with different meanings, or one is get customer, the one is get client, and so on. You see, this is a huge mess if you have to deal with multiple different services. The idea here with REST is that, fine, you have multiple different services. Services are just networks of resources that are interlinked. Links navigate in the representations. And then there are these HTTP methods. This is the, what's it called, the uniform interface that tells you how you can interact with each and every of these resources. This is the idea. Not every resource uh, allows you to use post and put and so on. This you will, you will understand from the description of the web service whether you can put on, uh, or not a new resource. But the idea is, a, is this. We really use get to retrieve representations. We have put to create new resources. There's a discussion also with post to create resources. Let's first go through the list and then I explain this discussion. We have uh, the possibility to update resources by either using post or put. And then we have delete for deleting resources. Um, in the very standard HTTP, the distinction between put and post, th there is a distinction there. So both allow you to send data to the web server. So this is one thing. With get, you only get data back. You don't send anything there, just the URL. With uh, put and post, you, get data, uh, so you, you can send data there. Then what does the ser server do when you send data there? Hopefully it does something. So it, it can create, for example, a new resource. Um, if you use put according to the standard, then it means that the URI you are using is exactly the URI where the web server should create this resource. So I, I say put my picture unity n slash Florian Daniel and the web server will create this resource at exactly the address unity n slash Florian Daniel. Uh, if you use post, it's slightly different. With, with post, you direct not to the URL that you want to create, but you kind of delegate to the web server to decide which URL to create. So you, the URL, the URI, let's say, you use when you issue the post request is the URI of, I don't know, a, a gateway, a manager, or of, of an entry point that then maybe creates my picture somewhere and sends me then back the URL, the created URL. So the difference between the two is, if I use post, I already have to know the exact URI I want the, the resource to be, to be created. With post, I say I have no clue. Dear server, do it yourself. This is what I want to have. The server creates the resource and sends me back then the URL. So this is a bit uh, a distinction. But there, there's a huge discussion. So somehow there's also a huge discussion because there's a lot of uh, freedom in the implementations you can, you can have. 
Um, good. What are the, the key properties of these operations? There are some very good uh, properties of these HTTP operations. They are called safety and idempotence. I think that's the pronunciation. Um, what is safety? Safety means that you can issue a same request as many times as you want. It has always the same effect. So if you, if you go to Amazon or Google.com and if, if you ask, if you write 10 times one after the other Google.com and you load the page, it's always the same page and you don't affect anybody. So you can ask as many times as you want. Nothing is going to happen on, on your side. You will always get the same result and you will always, uh, and, and the server will just treat you as 10 different users. So no, no issue at all. Uh, it's basically a read-only operation in this case to get. So as long as you read, you can do as many times read as you want. Then idempotence is for get, put, and delete, then, but probably also for post. Um, here the problem is that you change. So in, in the first case, when you only read, you never change the state on the server. So you don't change the state of the resources on the server. With uh, get, put, delete, you could also change the state of the resource. As I said, you send a picture to uh, Flickr, Flickr stores the resource. So um, the standard HTTP te uh, tells that this operation should be idempotent, which means if you send your picture, then it creates the resource. If you send it another time, it should not create a new resource with the same picture. So the, the key here is idempotence means that you send twice, three times, the same resource representation and the server creates just one representation, uh, one resource. It understands that this is the same resource and if you issue it two or three times, it does change the state of the server, but it does not affect or it does not uh, degenerate. So it understands that this is the same resource I already have and that's it. Uh, what is the, the benefit of this? I skip this, so why, why is this important? Because <coughs> this allows you to implement robust applications on, on a network. I, I think you all know the internet and you know that many, many times things just break. So you issue a request and you don't get the full page. You only get half of the HTML back or you only get, uh, I don't know, a, a half of a picture or especially if you are on a mobile internet or so, sometimes you just get broken stuff. But it's not an issue because get is safe, just do another get. Do get as long as you need in order to get all the necessary uh, feedback, uh, all the necessary data. That's it, that, that, that's a very good uh, or very important uh, property. You can, you don't have to think about it as a client, whether you uh, create a problem to the server or not if you invoke this several times. No, it's not a problem. And the same also for the, for, yeah, with it importance if you create something. On the network, things just go wrong sometimes. The internet is very complex, packets get lost. If you send, if you upload your picture, sometimes it works, but you know, uploading is slow and many times things broke halfway through your upload. The server will tell you, oh, I don't know, whatever error, upload error, and what do you do? Just upload it again. Just try until you get a success message. You don't have to worry about uh, side effects or so. This is maybe different from, uh, let's say, this is, it's very important, but if you think about regular programming with uh, just Java classes, then maybe your class internally uh, starts already changing something or creating something, then an exception ha happens it breaks and when you invoke it a second time then maybe you create a second resource. So the idea behind these standard methods of HTTP is exactly to prevent this. There's one caveat here. Um, this is the standard and this is the interpretation of the uh, methods described in this standard. But in the end, it's always, if you develop your own RESTful web server, sorry, a web service, then you have to implement these, these methods. Did, did any of you implement um, 
Java servlets, for example. Yeah, there you extended the do get method, right? Okay, I mean, the standard tells you that get is only read. But you know, if, if you develop Java servlets, you know, you can actually do in the do get method, you can actually do whatever you want. I mean, you can mess everything up even with a, with a get method. So this is then your own implementation <coughs> of the web server, sorry, of the web service. If you stick to the standard, you have these good and beneficial uh, properties. If you don't stick to the standard, you can mess everything up. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not so an expert now, but I know <coughs> the web is full of so-called restful web services that are not that restful at all and that don't satisfy these properties and that are actually crappy. So you can break them, they, they, some of them keep state, some of them uh, uh, do, uh, as I said, uh, uh, implement strange things inside get requests that should actually be in post requests. So as I said, the, all the stories I told you about post, get, put, and so on, is the interpretation the standard of HTTP tells you. And the REST principle tells you, apply these interpretations when you develop a service. But then it's up to you <laughs> if you stick to it or not. If you do, you have lots of good problems. If you don't, then you might mess it up. These are other two examples here of how not to develop a RESTful web service. Um, many applications misuse this uniform interface. You can, for example, make a GET request to delete a post. This is the uh, halfway interpretation of uh, the, the XML RPC way of programming I showed in the beginning where you explicitly write in your request which operation you refer to and the REST style. So here there are many people that say oh, RESTful means just XML over HTTP. Mm, not really. And what do they do? They say, okay, REST, get XML over HTTP. If you want to delete something, you can also issue just a, a get on this specific URL. And then if you do a get there, as I said, it's a, you have a servlet there with the do get method. And inside the do get method, I then implement a delete operation. But it's easy. So the clients, they, they have an easy life. They just need to do a get request, which is the easiest request. You can also do it from the, from the web uh, browser if you want. And it's, it's halfway the truth, because here you put your own operation names now into the URLs. Remember, this is no longer a uniform uh, interface. It, is, it looks like uniform because you use get and you use URLs, but in the URL you encode your get customer, for example, or your update customer would be here. This is a delete customer. And this is, of course, yeah. <laughs> You can do it. You can misuse whatever uh, architecture or programming platform as you like. But this is not really the, the rest full style. So this will mess up everything if you make a get in order to delete. And here we have something else. What is this? This is basically a, a request to create new is true name and I don't know, probably this is password or whatever, phone. This is a get request on a URL where if you read the URL, you understand that what the guys here actually want to do is they want to create a new, uh, let's say, user. This doesn't make sense from the principles we discussed right now. So don't do this. You can do it, but it's not uh, good programming. Um, this is basically what I just said. Some references and uh, what time is it? Let's see. We started a bit late. If you, if you want, we can have a look at uh, one example, RESTful service. I, I played yesterday a little bit with Twitter. Maybe in five minutes I can show you something, just to give you an idea about how this really looks like in practice. So let's do this. <coughs> no. Okay, so as I said, with, uh, with this 
web browser, you can issue easily HTTP requests. I installed this extension here of uh, Chrome. Oh, you're lucky I only have 28 minutes left <laughs> of battery. Um, this is called Postman, and it allows you to, to issue, for example, get requests to specific URLs. Let's make some, a very trivial example, my own website. If I do a get on my website, I will get HTML back. There we go. So I sent, this is the URL that identifies the resource. The resource is my website. The operation is get. There is a, a header parameter. Let's say this, we kick out. We don't need this, it works without. There are no specific parameters there. And what I get back is a plain XML format. So this is the representation of my website. Could also be just a picture or something else. But now let's have a look at uh, Twitter, for example. They have a, a RESTful API. If it works, yes, very good. So what do I do? I go here, go to the developer section, documentation, REST API. Good. And here we have uh, a web page that describes the possibilities offered by Twitter if you want to program Twitter. Instead of going to the UI of Twitter, you can just write your own software and spam Twitter with <laughs> tweets, for example. Um, there are different uh, operations about the timeline, for example, get mentions in your timeline, get the user timeline, which means your, the, the list of your own tweets. Then there are tweet specific uh, things. And you see they use the get, post, and so on uh, methods. Let's use the user timeline, for example. If I go here, then you see there's the resource URL, and this is the URL I was talking about. With this resource, I refer to my user timeline. I, I copy this now and go here, Postman. Let's kick out my address, and I put here the Twitter API um, resource of my timeline. Let's send. OK, I'm not authenticated. Let's learn how to authenticate. If we go back, this is one of the tricky things. If you go to Twitter on the website, you have login and password field. You do it manually, you push OK, and you are logged in. With the, now, with this postman, I mimic basically your own software. And if you want to talk to the Twitter API, you need to first authenticate. You need to tell who you are. Otherwise, they don't give you access. So there, if we go down here, there is somewhere lists. There's a lot of stuff. Authentication and authorization. Let's open a new tab. OK, so there is information about the REST API. There's a no out uh, authentication. <coughs> option and an application only authentication option. OAuth is a standard that is used by multiple, uh, multiple websites, but it's a bit more cumbersome. So let's just use the application only authentication. And uh, I already did some homework yesterday. We are not going to do everything now. But uh, the idea is this. In order to authenticate now here with, uh, with Twitter, we need to go through the uh, RESTful API, and we need to ask for uh, a bearer token, it's called. It's basically an access token that identifies then my application with Twitter. In order to do this, they, they give you this API, OAuth token, and so on. And through this API, you can get this access token. For instance, you have to... Uh, you have to have consumer keys and consumer secrets, and this is all information I already set up before. This is basically something I need to identify myself and my application with Twitter, so that in Twitter they know who I am. So I have the REST class here, 
And then Twitter assigns me lots of consumer keys and these horrible codes. They have no meaning, it's just identifiers. And here they ask me to basically send these identifiers to using this post message. Maybe you don't see. That's, uh, good. There's a post on this RESTful API. I send this authorization token, which I got from the Twitter website, content type, and so on. And then I ask for client credentials. Then if I go back, then hopefully, if everything goes well, they answer with an HTTP 200 OK message. And they give me this token here, the one in red. It's called the BRL token. And this is what I need. Because once I have this token, I can now hop, I can now interact with the actual API of Twitter. I can now get do get messages on the API, and I need to have this authorization token in the in the header of my request. So if I I already did this, somewhere I should have this token. Okay. Good. Then let's go back here. Postman, I need to add now to the header of this request uh, an authentication, authorization request. Vera, good. If I send now, then it tells OK. Not authorized because I did not tell Twitter which. Let me go back here. Which actual information I want to know. So I need to tell him that I want to have the user timeline, which I have to identify with this screen name parameter. And my screen name on Twitter is Florian Daniel IT. And now it should be possible to get. Hup. Looks horrible, but this is basically the tweets that I have in Twitter. It's a mess. There's the possibility to add a new property here, count, just one, send. And now we have just one single tweet. What we get back here is a, a JSON representation of how Twitter internally stores my tweet. The tweet is really trivial. Uh, it's back from a successful BPM conference. It, this is the only sentence I have. All the rest is internal data by, by Twitter. And um, uh, you can see, I only used now the get request. Twitter allows you to post, it allows you to delete, and you can do everything you can do through the Twitter uh, user interface, also through this uh, programming interface. And uh, maybe the last thing that I can show is, I, I told you so much about this analogy between this kind of RESTful service and just web applications, right? So I, I can show you that this is also true. Let me switch on here some developer tools. Should be possible to. Why can I not? It's not possible to get this down. OK. Let's make it smaller. Uh, up. If I go now and I load my own website, What's going to happen is we issue a GET request to this website. So you will see now things changing here, hopefully. Uh -huh. Very good. Professional picture. And uh, you see lots of, lots of resources here. These are all individual resources associated with my website. We start from floyandaniel.it. And what we get back, so this is what I issue in terms of REST, URL get, and then response code, status code, 200, OK. The response is what we saw before. It's just plain HTML. But the interesting part here is what I told you before about navigating, uh, about the links inside the representations that you get back from the RESTful service. Because if we look into the HTML here, we see we have uh, here, for example, links to CSS files. We have links to JavaScript files. We have links to 
somewhere there is my my picture with the kangaroo and these are links inside the representation of my web page and the browser now does exactly what I told you before the browser reads this representation identifies these uh, links and understands these are actions the action is load the picture load the CSS file and this is what it what you can see here uh, if we close this after reading the first file which is the HTML it loaded the CSS the second CSS then we have the the JavaScript JavaScript and somewhere here we have the kangaroo picture and there are lots of other resources there are then resources of the books so if I go down here there is the books and there is a Twitter plugin and all these things are slowly loaded by the web browser from just the interpretation of the web page and the links that are there and this is this is what happens with the web page this is exactly what when you program a restful web service this is what you have to implement yourself you access a URL you get a resource you interpret the links that are there and you understand whether these links are actions that interest you if not who cares you just keep the response as it is if instead you want to execute one of these resources you have to invoke the URL and this allows you to progress in the interaction with this web service um, okay that's it for today I think it was a bit packed with different uh, lots of different things uh, next time it's also me in in one week on, on Friday next week and uh, there maybe we have a look at, uh, at an example how to develop a known restful web service and we go slowly through the different steps good uh, questions or whenever you want also via email okay good thank you